on campus that day we've been talking about leading up to this for the 50th anniversary, May 4th, was one Peter Jettick. Mike, he joins us now. Peter, we appreciate your time, first of all. Oh, thanks for having me, guys. Uh, before we get to May 4th, tell us about you. Where'd you grow up? Why'd you go to Kent State? Well, actually, I grew up on the west side of Cleveland, went to West Tech High School, inner city high school. One of the best high schools in the country, though, at the time. <laughs> It was great, and um, I went to Kent by accident, actually. I was going to go to Cleveland State, live at home. I didn't have any money. And at the last minute, the day I graduated, I got a journalism scholarship to Kent that paid half of everything back then. It only cost $2,000 to go to school. I got a $1,000 scholarship, so that was great. So you end up at Kent State. What was your major? Uh, journalism, because I was a journalism major, and it was pretty interesting. And, and, of course, now as we go forward, I, I was in high school at the time. I was a little behind you, Peter. But uh, going back to that time, I, I'm trying to go back and remember as we get into the developments, uh, there were a lot of things, protests going on around the country before, before May 4th of that year, right? Yeah, everything was set off. You know, there were already a lot of uh, uh, demonstrations against the war. In fact, in November before the war, before of that year, of 1969, there was a huge demonstration in Washington. I went to that. It was called the November Moratorium, biggest demonstration in the history of the country against the war. But what really set it off was on Thursday, May 1st, when Richard Nixon, president, said he's going to invade Cambodia to help win the war. But he had promised to end the war. And actually, militarily, it wasn't a bad move because he was going to cut off the supply to North Vietnam. But it looked like he was expanding the war when he promised to end the war. That's why we elected him in '68. So campuses all across the country, it wasn't just Kent, they were all going crazy about this uh, Nixon going into Cambodia. Peter, uh, leading up to May 4th, though, was there just constant talk on campus? I mean, where two students are gathered, the, the, the war was the topic? What, what was the emotion, the feel every day? Yeah, that was the topic all the time, because we were the ones that were going to go. You know, a lot of my friends from high school already were over there, and they're coming back with horror stories. And, you know, it was a stupid war. Uh, it's probably the biggest mistake, I call it, in American history and foreign policy, because it was a civil war between North Vietnam and South Vietnam, and we weren't really offended by, affected by it. You know, like, our parents were all World War II vets, which was a great war. We had to save the country. But Vietnam didn't even have an Air Force or a Navy or nothing. They weren't any threat to us. But we were getting the same casualties as World War II. I mean, we lost over 50,000 kids over there, not counting all that were injured. So it was a terrible war, and the, the the mood of the country was changing. It was really, when it started, everybody said, okay, it was like World War II. We're going to go over there and kick their butt. But then we weren't doing anything, and kids were getting killed like crazy, and it, the mood of the country really changed against the war by the time Kent State happened. You know, Peter, just to go off of that, as you mentioned, uh, the young people being drafted at the time, and, and you and you had to go. What was the, 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 the deal was, though, if you were in college, there was an exemption. I mean, I know dorms were built all over the place. There were a lot of kids that just were going to school to avoid the draft at that time, right? Oh, yeah, that was a big deal. That really, boomed. That really made a boom in education because... You get uh, deferred, so for four years you didn't have to go until you were grad until you graduated. Then they would draft you. So colleges were booming, and like you said, a lot of people that didn't a lot of you know males because it was just males back then were drafted, and uh, they're all going to college to get out of the war. They figured in four years, hopefully mm -hmm. it'd be over, and they'd, you know get up because you know it wasn't like World War II where everybody wanted to go to war and save the country. The mood was this war was stupid. Why are we going getting these kids getting killed for the, for no reason? You know, Peter. I know you've told the story many times. Would you mind once more? Can you can you paint the picture? Give us the feel. What was it like on campus May Fourth? What played out that day from your angle? Well, what the leading up to it, like I said, first you had every, the Cambodia speech got everybody hot. Then, like Saturday Saturday night, uh, they had a little riot in downtown Ken. It wasn't that big, but a couple windows got broken. Kids got crazy. So the Ohio governor, James Rhodes, brought in the National Guard. And the National Guard took over, and they said, this is our campus now. We're in charge, kind of like some of the stuff that's going on today, you know. And uh, But not, the kids didn't get the word. There was a, a rally already planned, a protest was already planned for Monday, May 4th. And you didn't have the Internet, so a lot of kids didn't get the memo, you know. They thought it was okay, we're going to have this rally against the war, but the National Guard said you can't have it, so... So that day, everybody kind of showed up on front in the middle of campus called the Commons to have this protest, and the National Guard is there 
saying you can't do this, you know. And then it, uh, if you want me to go into detail, we can go on what happened to there. But that's what led up to it. What time of day was this, Peter? Right about noon. It was crazy. They used to always time to. This is interesting. They always time to protest around noon because a lot of the kids, most of the kids, weren't protesters. We had more people were watching, like myself. I was just a spectator. I was just watching a little, a little protest. But at noon, everybody's going to lunch, and they're all walking across. All that. It made the, the protest look bigger than they were. That was always a good idea to have them at noon. Uh, the pictures of that day, if, if, uh, if you don't mind, where, what was your angle? Where were you? What did you see? Well, I was kind of fortunate in one way. I saw the, the protest, and the National Guard, the protest happens on the commons. It's like a flat part in the middle of campus. And the students were there, and the National Guard came through with a jeep, said, you can't have this protest, we're in charge, and threw some, threw some uh, tear gas at them. Some of the kids picked up the tear gas, threw it back. And that's what always happened. The protest, it wasn't just Canada, it was the whole country. And that's kind of what happened all over the country, you know. Then, then they everybody go home, and, oh, we, we protested, we did our part, the National Guard broke it up, they did their part, and it should have been over. The little group of... Uh, for some reason, a little group of the National Guardsmen went over the top of the hill to the other side of a building. Uh, and I couldn't see them because I was still on the flat part of the campus. And that's where, for some reason, they got mad. And this has been debated a lot of reasons. Never did, truth never has come out about what happened there. And they turned around and, and they all shot at the same time. So there had to be an order or something. They got mad at the students, couldn't take it anymore, and shot. And it was terrible. Uh, one of my best friends was named Sandy Scheuer. She was a great girl, and she was just walking to class. She wasn't even watching the protest. She wasn't even part of the protest, and she got killed. Imagine how terrible that would be, going home and mm. your parents, you know, send you off to college, and you're walking to class, you get killed. You know, it was, that was just a terrible event. Peter, could you hear the shots? I could hear them, and they thought, we thought they were firecrackers, because a lot of times kids are throwing firecrackers and stuff. And where I was, it wasn't, we didn't even know they were shot until about 10 minutes later when an ambulance comes through the crowd. A couple of ambulances going over to the other side of the hill. So we're standing there, you know, and we're watching this this little protest going on there, and we didn't realize people got shot on the other side. I'm thinking, you know, I'm really thankful I didn't see it. Because, like I said, I knew two of the girls that got shot got killed. I know some of the kids got injured. Nine people also got injured. Four got killed. And just watching it, I think I'd have that post-traumatic stress syndrome like my dad had from World War II, you know, just sure. seeing where your friends get shot down, you know. So in one sense, I'm glad I didn't see it. But, you know, as a journalist, I would have have been more of an eyewitness right there. But I was close enough to see what was going on. Peter, about how many guardsmen were there? Oh, I'd say maybe 100. There weren't that many. And there weren't even that many protesters. That's what people don't realize. People thought all us, you know, the the country was still against the protesters. They thought we were all hippies like myself. I had long hair and a beard. They said, oh, you're a hippie. You're a protester, you know. Most of us weren't protesters. There's only like a handful of so we call them student radicals. We're really protesting. Most everybody was watching. You know, we had more, we had more spectators than than participants. You know what I mean? Is it a myth or fact that there was like professional? I was to say professional, but there were uh, protesters that were coming in from other states and going to different campuses. Was that any truth to that at Kent? No, I don't think so. That was never never proved. There were there were, but there were people from other that came into Kent because like the Friday night that they had the. The riots, not there wasn't even a riot, just some action in downtown Kent where they broke some windows. That's what brought the National Guard in. One of my friends from from high school said he came in and broke a window. And he didn't go to college there, you know. And and they had people coming in, but they weren't outside agitators, like professional agitators. Just Kent was an action spot back then. They didn't have the flats. So kids from all over northeast Ohio, Akron, Cleveland, they all came to Kent on the weekends, you know. So we had all these kids coming to Kent. But I don't think they ever proved any outside agitators that were there. It was... Most of the, the protesters were, you know, the student, the, the student radicals. Everybody knew who they were. They, mm-hmm. so. Peter, the rest of that day, uh, I mean, this is a tragedy. Uh, everybody, you know, word begins to spread even more. What happened the rest of the day on campus? I mean, classes are canceled. You went home. What, what, what happened? Oh, that's when it was crazy. To, you know, this is like, well, I say it's like today. Uh, all the colleges across the country started really rioting, you know, because of Kent. And it was an international event. I had a friend that was going to school in Switzerland at the time, and she saw it happen. She saw it right when it happened on TV over there. You know, it was all over the all over the world. It was an international event, but they closed Kent and they closed a lot of schools across the country. And we had to finish our school year from home, just like they're doing now. But we didn't have online stuff. You know, you had to send it in the mail and call your professor on the phone and 
snail mail of some stuff, you know, your term papers and stuff. It was a crazy time to be alive, and and the whole the whole country shot set down. But it really did. They say it really helped end the war in Vietnam because after that, and the whole country went crazy, and uh, it, it kind of really made the Vietnam War end a lot quicker. We think at least that happened. You know, Peter. Of, of course, the the song "Ohio" by Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. I've heard. I believe they recorded that song. I mean, within days. After the shootings, and I think it was being played by radio stations almost within a, a week or so. Is that accurate? Do you recall any? Do you have any knowledge of that? Well, yeah, I can't prove it. I'd have to, you know, we'd have to double check that. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure you're right on that. Yeah, it came out right away. They did it right away. I hit the airwaves right away. I remember hearing it right away at home. You know. Oh, here's another thing. Uh, you know, like I said, where I was on the other side of the the building. You know, and then the word got out, hey, they killed some students. Everybody tried to go home. I tried to call my house, you know, because you had to use pay phones back then. The whole, the whole, and then I went home to my apartment and tried to call them. The phones, the whole phone system crashed in Kent. So many people were trying to call back then that they actually crashed the phone system. It's something you hardly, you hardly ever see, you know. Uh, Peter Jennings, Peter, you, you captured this uh, in many different ways and pieces you've written over the years. This is the 50th anniversary of the, that tragic day, May 4th. Uh, but also in in a, in a in a in a literally a novel. Tell tell us about hippies. Tell tell us about the project and uh, out, it was out a few years ago and now available, of course, through ebooks and all. Yeah, my hippies book. You can check it out on hippiesbook.com. The, it's our website and see all the reviews and everything. I wanted to tell the story because they say I wanted. You know, I'm a writer. I've been a journalist all my life. I wanted to write a novel, and they say write what you know. Since I was there, I knew the all the stuff leading up to it. So I, my novel is about how crazy the times were leading up to May Fourth because. Uh, there's just so much going on and, and all this craziness, and I knew some of the participants and all this stuff. And I just try to show, you know, what happened, how all led up to this May 4th stuff. But I try to make it a love story because make it entertaining. I didn't want to write a nonfiction book where, you know, most people don't want to read a nonfiction book about, well, this happened here, this happened there. You know, they can find that online. I try to make it entertaining. So it's kind of a love story. And all this other stuff is going on, and while well, they're trying to have a relationship, and so and it all uh, accumulates on May fourth when you know the students get killed. You know, Peter, for Kent State University, this was something that the university really has well lives with to this day. But but it really impacted the the way it was perceived for a while, didn't it? Oh yeah, it really hurt uh, their uh, their recruiting for about ten years. It took about ten years for, and they tried to pretend it didn't happen for a while, which was a mistake. Now they've embraced it. They were going to have all these festivities this this weekend because of the 50th anniversary, but they got canceled because of the pandemic. But, uh, yeah, for about 10 years, it really hurt. Nobody wanted to go to Kent. They, they say, hey, you can't send your kids to Kent. They might get killed, you know, which wasn't true because, like I said, there, there were riots all over the country. It just happened to be a Kent where, the, for some reason, the National Guard kind of got out of hand. Is there anything we haven't asked you in terms of, you know, the why for this? I guess we look back at, at you kind of detailed – the explosive situation that, that, that could have been there, but nothing like this, this kind of shooting had occurred in other demonstrations. Anything else that you look at in your mind, how it actually got to that point that where, where this did occur? No, like I said, it could have happened. I mean, I, there's a lot of rumors. There's, no one has ever from the National Guard has ever really come out and say why they did it. You know, I have my theories, like I said, someone had to give them an order because they all shot within 13 seconds. It wasn't like people try to think, well, they, all of a sudden they felt threatened because someone threw a rock at them or something, which wasn't true. You know, they all turned and shot at the same time. So some, they must have got mad. The one thing I like to say is, you know, kids didn't take that serious back then. A lot of people didn't, a lot of, most of the kids came out afterwards didn't even know the guns were loaded. They didn't think the kids were, had loaded guns. Like I said, I went to inner city high school, West Tech, and we had more brain, you know, street smarts about, you know, guns and knives. And, but most of these kids were naive kids from the suburbs. And it's not smart if someone's holding a rifle, you don't throw a rock at them or you don't give them the finger, you know what I mean? Yeah. So a lot of people didn't have that that sense. But but, but I wasn't just Kent, though. Like I said, every all our colleges did that. So I don't know. I think the guard just got out of hand. They should have never turned and fired. I don't know what – no. That's never come out. What what really uh, what's really behind that? Every anniversary of this, there's a, a different layer, a different story that comes out. A few years ago, I remember when they studied the the audio. Uh, there was actually a recording and trying to pick out the layers of what was said or what who said what or was there actually an order? And of course, uh, I mean this this mar. Don't get me wrong. The families that day who were affected with the loss of loved ones, the injuries. Of course, it 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 marred and, and, and marked Governor James Rhodes for years to come because of the way it was handled. Right. Oh yeah, and that's uh, they've a lot of people blame Rose for just calling in the National Guard. Right. 
But uh, like you said, yeah, that was that's interesting. I almost forgot about that. They did. Uh, there was some guy did a study, and he was trying to pick out the uh, the orders and all that. And they because there was an audio recording. Their thing was uh, because Kent had a journalism school. They had all these photographers that were there, so they had a lot of good pictures. Uh, these guys were really good photographers from the journalism school. All student photographers. One guy wanted to pull a John Philo. He wanted to pull a surprise for his picture. And uh, of, the, of one of the dead people and a, and a girl uh, screaming over the dead body, but uh, yeah, it was it was just a lot of it was a lot different back then. But uh, I don't I don't and they, they did try to get the tapes and, and 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 figure that out. I remember that was a controversy for a while. I don't know how that ever uh, fell out. Peter uh, Jedick, uh, kind enough to share his uh, remembrance of uh, 50 years ago, May 4th, at uh, Kent State again. Hippiesbook.com, dot com, where he has uh, captured this in a novel. You can. Uh, Check it out, and the, the history of that day as it plays out in a story, uh, well told. Peter, we thank you so much for sharing. Thank you for your time. Oh, thanks a lot, guys. You guys thanks, agree? Peter. Okay, Bill, Mike, bye-bye. Thanks a lot, guys. You guys thanks, agree? Peter.